my immediate reaction was this just kind of sounds like her reiterating everything that she's already said if i could go to your immediate self i would strangle you there's something very desolate and aching here which i think is super similar to red's most effective moments this is a scorpio anthem sure <laughs> sure it's a scorpio anthem scorpio anthem everyone's like she stole olivia's idea and Olivia taylor did rodrigo better. Yes. Ha -ha. get you back came out in september of 2023. Taylor has been working on this record for two years. I am very certain that she wrote this before she even was aware of the existence oh, of I'm Olivia's song. Oh, I'm sure she song. was pissed when it came out. And it also shares a trait with Willow, which is a corny line that threatens to ruin the song, but doesn't. But what's so devastating here is that Taylor is grieving a past version of herself that she like has no access to anymore. And it really seems like when they put the brakes on whatever was going on in 2014, and we know it didn't actually actualize very much, she feels as they come back to each other and circle back later. And when they did eventually come back together, he kind of seemed the same, but all of her had, you know, changed like midnight rain and she could feel herself no longer being the person he was once interested in. <laughs> what is Aaron doing in the studio as she's going, where's the death rattle breathing? He's just going, <laughs> I'm loving yeah. it. And it's like, you say you're tired of the drama and you don't want to do it anymore, but who's bringing it up? It needs to be said. Welcome back to the evolution of a snake. I'm Zach. And I'm Madeline. And this is Tortured Poetology Part 2. Yes. You heard it, part two. I can't believe that we're here basically dissecting an entire other album. Madeline, how was it for you getting your notes together for this week? Was it easy? Was it hard? It was hard at first, I'll be honest with you. It was really hard at first. Like doing the first Torture Poets episode, it almost put me in my casket. <laughs> I was really like, this is over. I don't want to do it anymore. But these notes for this one, because we had like a few days, it actually wasn't so bad. You know what? I would like to say thank you to everybody for the support and saying you can do it and believing in us because it almost didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> it almost didn't happen. And yet here we are. I think maybe we could begin by talking about, there's been a lot of discussion about Taylor's prolific output and her compulsion to kind of open the floodgates and just release everything. And when I was doing my notes for this episode, I noticed that there was a certain point in this track list where I was like, I simply don't want to go further. Like I, I don't, there's stuff here mm -hmm. that I don't think is warranted having a discussion about. It felt as though if this had maybe been six tracks, it would have been received really well and it wouldn't have caused this whole discussion about whether Taylor is, I guess, I, some people are calling it like oversharing or like being greedy. And there is an element of that for sure, because she wants to get as many streams and break as many records as possible. But I think also she's just in this like freewheeling creative space. And I see the pluses and the minuses of it. What do you think about that in terms of the second part of the record? Well, I think that here's my truth. And this is what I really think that she should have done. And this would have been gorgeous as a fan. I think she should have released Torture Poets, and then two weeks later, literally a fortnight, why didn't she do this? A fortnight later, release the anthology. I don't think we would, maybe some people would still be having this conversation about she's doing too much, she's doing this, she's doing that. But I just feel like as a fan, as somebody who wants more content, that would have been absolutely gorgeous. And it would have really, I would have cried my eyes out. It would have been like, this is the greatest day of my life. As it is, when I logged in and I saw that there was a whole another album to listen to, me, as a person who logs in and has to, you know, put my you know, feet to the grindstone, uh, I wasn't smiling. <laughs> in the first half an hour i was frowning so it's like i do understand mm -hmm. it's too much like i what people especially people on the outside being like it's just like too much it's way too much like even i was saying that and i'm a swifty and i guess like what's the utility of giving too much as well because i like to think i talk about this a little bit more in my video tomorrow but i am thinking about taylor's legacy all the time just as a a fan and also a critic you know we're we're chronicling literally we have a bird's eye view of her career because our whole pro like podcast project is to go year by year through her career and i think what you lose when you take away like the constraints of okay i can have a maximum of 16 songs is the message becomes uh, a little bit unclear and i think that tortured poets actually just the standard edition alone has a really interesting message and has so many things going on within it that when you get to the anthology 
it's not even that the ideas are bad because most of them with a few exceptions are actually really interesting but they don't like add up to the whole project like they don't add a new layer of understanding to the first edition that we didn't get on the second edition and i do feel like if she's going to do this a second part it needs to be kind of hopefully sufficiently different to something that she's done before because to me the anthology is ever more the re-up it really is that's my perspective on it it's like ever more part two and i'm seated and clapping and cheering but it feels totally incongruent sometimes with what's on the actual standard edition of the album it's really interesting that you bring that up because i've been really struggling with the idea i go back and forth like every day sometimes even in a, in a single day are they two different albums or are they one album i literally can't decide i've made a playlist where i kind of i've I have two playlists. One is 27 songs long and another one is 22 where I really cut it back. And it's both albums combined into one. And I find when I listen to the 22 song one, I'm like, this is good. <laughs> like, I'm like, this, mm -hmm. uh, this makes sense as one concise album. But I find that when I like put, try to listen to them both back to back and I'm not putting them in among each, do you understand what I mean? Like in among each other mm -hmm. and like creating a narrative out of all the songs and cutting what doesn't fit then it's I, then I get word soup in my brain. It's confusing. It can it's be confusing. confusing. And yeah. again, the Swifties are going to eat it up regardless. But I think there is a bigger picture to, than just more, more, more. And I read an interesting article that was like talking about how there are kind of two schools of thought. One of them is that Taylor needs to, you know, stick to the constraints of a traditional LP or like a vinyl LP, which is, you know, back in the day, they literally had to whittle their albums down to like, what was it, 12 songs to... And that forced them to get really specific about like the mood, the tone they were creating and really think about what are the best songs that people are going to like the most. And then there's also, there was another perspective from like a hedge fund person, some sort of like finance person that was like the, the game of like relevance is about prolific output. It's about creating as much as possible. And you need to be bombarding the listeners with content very regularly and it doesn't matter now because the pace of content is so high you're getting so much of it it doesn't matter that out of thir for example 30 songs there are only three really good songs in the long run those three really good songs are going to be remembered and those 27 kind of not good songs will be forgotten so i thought that was like an interesting take on it too i think taylor l needs to land somewhere in between those two schools of thought i i think thinking about like going forward like what she's going to do after this I think like with the re-recordings project and with Midnight's and with Torture Poets and with it being a double album, I do think that first of all, she needs a break. Let's start there. And second of all, she needs to next album. I mean, I don't want to say needs to, but you know what I mean? Like it, it, in my perfect suggestion. fantasy world, a suggestion, <laughs> if you, you're taking suggestions, um, I think that she should probably try to do like not another 1989 in the sense that it's exactly like 1989, but 1989 is probably mm -hmm. her best example of her really whittling. And like really creating something that was one. Trimming the fat. Exactly. Trimming the fat. And 1989 is like bulletproof to me. It's like you can't say anything. <laughs> you can't say and fucking fearless anything. Too. Honestly, yeah. Fearless Standard Edition is pretty front to back. Yeah. Also very good. And both of those albums have clearly these bonus songs. I mean, in the case of Fearless, actual bonus songs. Also 1989, three bonus songs. Like songs like New Romantics and Wonderland and You Are In Love were good enough to go on the standard edition of 1989 for sure. But the 13 tracks that she has, bellissima. Right. Bellissima. The Gorgina. story that it tells, amazing. And the fact that she kept songs like Is It Over Now and Now That We Don't Talk, which to me are just as good as any of the like better songs on 1989, that she kept those aside is a good thing. But now I think she's like, I'm in my hyperproductive era. Everybody wants the 10-minute songs. Everybody wants the vault tracks. Let me just give it all. And... I mean, Taylor fatigue, is it actually real? I don't know, because they keep saying she's over <laughs> and she keeps winning. And yet she persists. She persists. And for I a think fortnight, she really, literally. I mean, I think that a lot of the criticisms that people are lobbying against the album, specifically about its length, are fair. And I do think a lot of people being like, is this girl ever going to go away in any time soon? Just give us a break. I think that's also kind of fair, too. But it doesn't matter. I think they're in an echo chamber. And I think... <laughs> It's the Eras tour we are all the time, 24-7. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Life is literally an Eras tour. Yeah. That's what it is. I'm happy with that. 
I'm I don't want the era tour to end. So I'm still living. let's just keep it going. We maybe have a tortured poet set. I mean, if you've been following her YouTube short journey, she's been sharing what seems to be behind the scenes clips of a tortured poet set on the era tour. I wonder if any of the anthology tracks are going to make it on there. I've been thinking a lot about specifically what she's going to do, like mm. to like curb the set back. Like the set as it is now i had this like crazy vision of her combining evermore and folklore into one set and i was like she's never gonna do that because the there would be riots in the streets let's start there but it i think it would done, be though. the smartest if we're, thing if to we're do getting the sh- <laughs> if we're getting the show yeah. down folklore is the longest part and I mean, the other I ones just... are pretty like if she cuts anything from speak now she's going to jail because it, well i mean you can't do that begin with that's mm-hmm. not fair I, I think she needs to trim the red set too that needs to, we need mm-hmm. to be doing half half of we are never getting back together. We need to be doing a mega mashup. Yeah. We are never ever getting back together. And I you in trouble. I don't know why we're doing the full thing. Yeah. We are never Me- all together. mega mix. Well, I mean, it's it's difficult because the people that have seen the tour already are going to riot. Are the people who haven't seen the tour yet are going to riot in the streets? Oh, that's I always thought that maybe the Eras tour was like because it confused me when she put out the movie. I was like, the people are still going to see this show next year. Like, you want to show them the show that you're going to bring? Well, <laughs> jokes on jokes me. on you. Joke's on you, baby. It's a different show. It seems like she's going to do Who's Afraid of Little Old Me. I peeped those circus. I, I think she's going to do Who's Afraid of Little Old Me. I think she's going to do I Can Do It With a Broken Heart. I mean, unfortunately, it just makes oh, sense. well. <laughs> it just it makes perfect sense. Done. It has to be done. She'll and do she's going to do Fortnite. I think. Oh, Fortnite. Yeah. I would really love to see But Daddy, I Love Him. Now, I want to see her running, doing the August run on the stage with her dress on button. Oh, that would be delicious. I and I mean, that, to put I that on it. the Eras tour would be kind of hilarious. I would, I'd be giggling. She's cracked. She's cracked. It'll be interesting to see what her favorite songs are, because I feel like that's kind of how she picks as well. Especially because there aren't very many singles. There's one single, so obviously there's that. But everything else well, is like... Yeah, especially because she's doing it like so soon after the album came out. She doesn't even know what the fan favorites are. She doesn't even know Guilty of Sin has taken the world by storm. Does she know that? She doesn't. She needs to know that. She doesn't know that we played them Downtown Lights and they hadn't heard it in a while. And people were forever changed by that. Yeah. She doesn't know that yet. So that's kind of a damn shame. And Fresh Out the Slammer are like really stunners to me. Like really growing on me every single day. I think it's probably out of all the critiques that you can make about Jack and Taylor's like um, work together and how maybe we need a little bit of something else thrown into the mix. Guilty of Sin and Fresh Out the Slammer are the two standouts of like what they can oh. possibly create when they're getting out of their bag. They said and they're Let's... fresh sounding. They're they fresh. Yeah, they fresh. Yeah. It doesn't sound like any other songs that Taylor has ever done. Mm-mm. Both of them. Because totally I different. can do it with a broken heart kind of is a rerun of things she's done before but it, it sounds like midnight but it's like it house down boots and we don't give a fuck we don't care <laughs> we don't care <laughs> we literally don't care well i guess we can just get into it why don't we start with the first track on this second record continuation whatever you want to call it the black dog this is one of my favorites. What was your instant reaction, Madeline? My <laughs> instant reaction was as I was like sitting there reading the lyrics. Keep in mind, this was only 24 hours after the fact. So I was like primed to say exactly this. My immediate reaction was this just kind of sounds like her reiterating everything that she's already said. Was it hazing? Do you hate me? Is this a joke? Why did this happen? I'm so sad. I was like, okay we been here done that but that's again one of the perils of the double album but in her defense mm-hmm. this is really like one of the only ones where i feel that way on the anthology where it's like okay this already happened on torture poets this is like the only one perhaps and it's grown on me over time so but that was my immediate thought was wow like, yeah yeah well if 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 i could go to your immediate self i would strangle you um so Period. i'm glad i'm not meeting her currently Um, what do I have to say about the black dog so much? First of all, the modulation on the song is really wonderful from her like super breathy vocal to the muted piano. And then that walloping synth on old habits die screaming. That is exactly the delivery of that line that I kind of imagined when I saw it written and we didn't know what it was going to sound like. Um, and you know how we kind of thought for a while that Torture Poets was going to sound like Red or that it was going to be like Red? In sensibility and lyricism, I think this song is the closest thing to that prediction. I find that the lyricism here is really simplistic and pared back compared to the like 
excessive floral language elsewhere, but it's still buoyed by like some really random and incisive detail, the pub, the black dog that was intertwined in the magic fabric of their dreaming and so formative in their love story. There's something very desolate and aching here, which I think is super similar to Red's most effective moments. Um, and I love how we follow her down the rabbit hole of missing someone. I remember when she was promoting Red, she said that, we're, that the world is like a different place for the heartbroken. Time moves differently. It can be really agonizingly slow and then really terrifyingly fast. And I think this is de depicted so well in this song with that like slow crescendo of the piano and that sudden interruption of the old habits die screaming. It like reflects that jaggedness of reality when you're like really, really struggling. Yeah, I really liked that. <laughs> this is obviously a song you like a lot more than I do. <laughs> I like listening to this like <laughs> sure yeah 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 sure 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 um i really liked the uh again we're talking about the starting line sorry it's like one of the best <laughs> the, the thing about the starting line reference and i just i don't think i really talked about this when we were talking about torture poets but now that it's come up again it's like we have to talk about the fact that she's bringing up the starting line repeatedly that is the funniest fucking thing because if you listen to the song that's literally the story of their entire lives tell me what you thought about I have you never are listened gone to the song. and so alone the worst is over you can have the best of me we got older but we're still oh young my God. we never no. grew out of this feeling <laughs> that we won't give up hello oh, no. to hello. have best of me by the starting line reference not once but twice in a taylor swift ad. i mean it, it blows my mind greatest song ever made it gets. if if this was 2003 let me tell you turn it up <laughs> <laughs> hilarious i just think that this is like a straight up broken hearted song and it's so affecting to me and like i feel like this is what i i mean when i say she's at her best when she withholds a little bit like we're touching on all the themes that the muse has brought through the rest of this album how this person's moods and desires can like change at the drop of the hat how he portrayed himself to be more serious about their relationship than he was and i like the like double entendre of the black dog too and she describes him later as leaving his tail leaving with his tail between his legs we been <laughs> knew that he just dropped and Got ghosted her that that's kind of the gag of it all is it really like the ending of it like it wasn't an old habits die screaming it truly was like a mm, bye thanks so much for the sparkling summer i'm gonna leave now yeah it's really like the little bitch move of it all it's crazy it's really crazy she left with his tail between his legs <laughs> left with his tail well Delicious. what did you do to him what did you do to him? Uh, to I mean, there's something to be said for that. <laughs> there is something to that be said for that. Is he ran out the door. <laughs> she also loves to take a dig at her men dating younger women. I think this is an insecurity of hers. She really doesn't like that. She has mentioned it here and elsewhere. Um, a lot of people are debating whether this is about Joe or Maddie. I think it can kind of go either way. The events manager of the pub said that it does have a certain blonde regular, but I don't know if he was talking about Joe or Taylor, but there's a line in like smoke versus clean air too, which is like kind of hinting at Maddie, but I don't know if it's super significant. Do we have proof that either of them spends a lot of time there? No. I mean, there's no pictures of either of them at the black dog. I never <laughs> even knew it existed. Period. I thought we well, were going to be talking go. about the symbolism of a black dog. I wasn't thinking about a bar. So I thought that too. I thought it was going to be about depression. And it is, but not in the way that we think. Not in the way that we thought. It was a curveball. Not in the way that we thought. Well, I give this song a 10 out of 10. And you also give it a 10 out of 10. Thank you. Sure. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said. Exactly. <laughs> Up next, and we're going so strong, I want to get you back. Thoughts? This is a Scorpio anthem. Sure. <laughs> sure. It's a Scorpio anthem. Scorpio anthem. Um, this one, I really like. I mean, if I had to say anything, even if it's in handcuffs, I'm leaving here with you, boys. <laughs> if I had to say one thing and one thing alone about the song, that's what I would say. It does pick up something about the song that drives me fucking crazy. Do you know when it opens? There's like the drums come in and there's also like vocal in it. And it's like, it sounds like yeah. somebody's talking. I hate it. That mm -hmm. really triggers like something labyrinth. in me. Yeah. There's something strange about that. And I, pa, pa. every time it happens, <laughs> pa, pa. overall, um, I'm cricketing. Wow. <laughs> I, I, I'm literally cricket. I don't have anything to say about this song. I, I skip okay, it. Okay. Well, Welcome back to the Switchologist YouTube channel because I'm the I want to get you backologist and I have a lot to say. First of all, I want to talk about the thing. Have you you've been seeing this nonsense about Olivia Rodrigo, right? Everyone's like, she stole Olivia's idea and Taylor Olivia Rodrigo. did better. Yes. Ha ha. Taylor well, yes. Rodrigo, first of all. Second of all, 
Get You Back came out in September of 2023. Taylor has been working on this record for two years, and this reeks of that in-between period in the summertime to me. Just that's what the song sounds like. I am very certain that she wrote this before she even was aware of the existence oh, of Olivia's song. I'm sure she song. was pissed when it came out, too. She, yeah, <laughs> she was goes. mad. And also, I remember when Get Him Back came out, a lot of people said, this sounds like a Taylor Swift song. Do you remember? The haters, the Olivia haters were saying, this sounds like we are never, ever getting back together. This is a ripoff, blah, blah, blah. And I say, why can't we just let two queens have their beautiful crowns? Why not? Well, here's the tea of it. They're really different. Like, the, the kernel of the idea is similar, but if you listen to the songs back to back, two completely different songs two completely different vibes two completely different women why can't we let them both rock i don't get it olivia's in her avril lavigne bag and taylor is doing a very classic taylor thing which is being crazy and that's what i love so much about this song i kind of i okay everybody gets mad at me when i like start saying things are about joe but i think this one is about joe but actually no it could be about maddie now that i'm looking at it because it is kind of about someone ghosting you and like exiting the premises but she I don't know. Actually, yeah, I'm going to strike that from the record. I don't know who this is it's, about, it, but that it's doesn't been erased. matter to me. It's been forgotten. It's, we can't. <laughs> this rings to me, though, that it's about two people who have broken up multiple times before. That's kind of where I was going with the Joe thing, because the Maddie thing happened, like, it started and it stopped, and then it was over. Like, it was so brief, but it was so intense. This, to me, sounds like two people who know each other very, very well and have known each other for years and are still kind of orbiting each other in social circles. I think there's an interesting line here at the beginning did your research you knew the price going in you knew what this life was going to be when we begun so just surrender you know that it's going to be chaos you know that you're going to get hounded by the paparazzi and everyone's going to hate you um and that line i'll tell you one thing i can tell when someone still wants my body okay miss girl once you fix your face i'm going in she's crazy she's crazy she's she hasn't decided crazy. whether she wants to kill him or kiss him i mean girls 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 to me it's everything i really am obsessed with this i'm i'll tell you one thing honey i can take the upper hand and touch your body flip the script and leave you like a dumb house party or i might just love you to the end to me this is very much giving you've won me back before now i'm going to do the same to you we know that joe won her back multiple times when they were on the rocks notably in cornelia street and i think she was resentful of him because she wanted to be with him forever and she felt that he starved their love of having any real shot hence her cruelty and devotion here in leaving him like a house party or loving him till the end she like doesn't know if she wants to punish him or follow through on that like vague promise they made to each other um and this is just the kind of crazy that i love to see and i think the cadence and the pacing of this chorus really reminds me of dress that's why i think oh, i like it so much because of the falsetto there's something about it i'm an aston well, martin don't don't bully <laughs> my dear sis my good sis wait till we get to chloe or sam or marcus okay you'll have your turn in the delusional sun i know you will well, the thing about that is that I'm right. <laughs> That's the crazy well, thing. Well, and if you just, you just you just don't get it, you just don't get. It. I don't want to get you back. The albatross. But I did know that this was a Dustner production as soon as it came on. It really reminds me of Willow a lot. Like the guitar really reminds me of Willow, and it also shares a trait with Willow, which is a corny line that threatens to ruin the song, but doesn't. We have come back stronger than a '90s trend, and Willow boo hiss, and we have wise men read fake news on the albatross. Which to me, I was like, you really had me in my fairy tale bag. And then we had to go to the fake news. Why? <laughs> to me, it's like there's like a, a pyramid, a tier, if you will. We have, uh, first of all, um, worst of them all, uh, not the kind that's thrown. I mean, the kind of where a tree has grown. And then after that, we have <laughs> that, no one that around to tweet round it. To tweet. And then we have I Come Back Strong and then a 90s trend. The fake news one is on the tier. But to me, it's like bottom. It doesn't ruin the song for me. The 90s trend no, bullshit and will doesn't. literally almost ruins the entire bridge. I'm like, what? Because she delivers it, it like she's reminded giving me of Willow. It, it mm -hmm. the production on the song really is like, I, I think that's like one of the first things I said about it. If I. I've, I, I mean, this, there's multiple moments on this album where I was saying Taylor Blair Witch Swift, she's back. You know, we've been missing her. We needed her back. <laughs> there wasn't really any Blair Witch on Midnight's and baby, we've been needing it. We've been needing this for a hot we minute. Need... We've been needing it. And to it. be fair, side B anthology is full of incantations. 
Oh, it really is. Like the, I think anthology is like a really good title for it. There are some songs that like mm. really fit the fucking bill, and this is one of them because she's like referencing like an old, um, what would you call it? Like an old wives' tale, an old a fair, a, folklore yeah, like story, story, fairy tale, tale um, about the albatross, which I actually thought was really clever, but I had to look it up because I was like, now what are we talking about? What? I'll be honest. Yeah, I, I also had to look. Somebody it up. else told me. Somebody else told me. I'm not. I'm not too big to admit it. Mm. I had to look it up. <laughs> but now Slay I know. Slay queen. Slay queen. Melodically, <laughs> it's very beautiful. I think it's a really gorgeous song. This has grown yes. on me a lot since I first yeah. heard it. I actually mm -hmm. play this all the time. There's something kind of. That, I, I don't know. That she's very obsessed with being locked up in towers. On this she's record. in her tower all the time on this album. <laughs> I'm in my tower. I was in my tower. I'm in my tower. It's like okay, we get it. You're Rapunzel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. I like the imagery, like I get what she's doing, and I kind of like the repetitiveness because it kind of like ties the songs together and like how they all kind of interconnect, even if they don't. <laughs> it's like, well, even if she's don't, in her tower. Even if they don't. <laughs> I think that the form of this song, because Aaron Dessner has produced it for her, is really able to contain the kind of wordy lyricism that has come to de mm. define the torture poets era. Um, and something that I like about this section of the record is how Taylor is reflecting on the ways that love has made her behave or how she is made to behave when she's in love. This song and the prophecy are really linked in a very beautiful way. And I think this is a really eloquent way to discuss her unique position of how her fame makes her this kind of omniscient figure that like eclipses and destroys all of her personal relationships. And it's also like the, the most literary song on the record. She's allegedly referencing a couple of different writers here, but I think the overall effect is old timey, which is a vibe she loves to sink into oh, she loves from time to time with varying degrees of success. Incidentally, the other song that I think is set in a different time and doesn't have an, a line about fake news is The Bolter. That song takes place in 1954. <laughs> it just does. It, it just does. An old town lead yeah. it. Literally. Yeah. That's, that's where it is. She loves, and she also, I mean, we're also in the 1830s here. She's a time traveler. She's a time traveler. She's here. That's she's there. She's, she's everywhere. She's going back. She's yeah. telling, she's taking stories from the past and bringing them to us. But I think the, there's this image here that I had. I don't know if you had this too when I was listening to it, where she's almost like a dragon, like a mystical, much whispered about figure, this like superstition almost mm. that people make great journeys to warn great men about the mm. danger of. And he Period. goes on his quest to find her anyway. And she describes her lover here as like shooting the messengers who tried to warn him about her. And also one less temptress, one less dagger to sharpen. Perfect lyric for this song. Perfect lyric. She got him. She got him good. Something <laughs> she that struck got me him. Uh, when I was like going through like and really looking at this album and thinking about the lyrics that she put up at the pop up, that was one of them. Out of context, that was crazy. When I saw that lyric out of context, <laughs> I was literally gagging. And then there was another one. What was the one that sounded like it was about Joe? Oh, I can't remember it. But it's like oh, completely statues not about that. Made to wait. She read Herring Dust. Maybe it wasn't even intentional. She was just like, these are some really good lyrics. And we were like, Joe! And, and she, she was, was like, right. Whatever. No. Mm -hmm. She's like, I don't care who this is about. I yeah. think she's working with the analogy here that like every man who dates her has like ample warning to run away. Her myth is loud. It's legendary. We know that Taylor Swift is a man eater. We know she's going to go crazy and write songs about you to settle scores when you leave. We know that men are, you know, generally left worse off when she's done with them and yet some of them choose to ignore this destiny and surrender to her anyways she's the death you chose you are in terrible danger and they don't give and they're like i'm in love <laughs> i'm in love i don't <laughs> care <laughs> they're like yeah she lures slay. them right in i live for it she gets gorgina in. and then we have Bellissimo. gorgina and we have the the bridge when that sky rains fire on you and your persona non grata i'll tell you how i've been there too and none of it matters i really like this bridge because i think what ends up happening to them is they become like her whoever she's dating they become isolated from normal life when they date her and ironically only she can relate to the alienation that they experience by dating her because like this is her life right and exactly. that isolation creates like an artificial intimacy us versus the world we see that through so that's on but daddy i love him that's all the way through her relationship with joe um and i think she kind of flips the narrative on the bridge and plays with perspective so instead of believing that she is the terrible danger we're then pointed to look at the people who are sending these men the warnings right. about her like what if they're lying what if they're what the men should be worried about? Hmm? Jackals raise their hackles. You couldn't conceive it. They dragged you from your bed. And then at the end, she swoops in. She's the albatross, but she's here to your rescue. Exactly. She's the albatross. Period. It's storytelling. Not everybody gets it. Up next, Madeline's Stan song. This is her favorite song 
from the whole shebang, Chloe or Sam or Sophia or Marcus. Now, this hit me like a ton of bricks. This song is crazy. You're like, I don't want to hear this. I know I'm not going to like it. I don't want to hear this. And then next thing I knew, I was taken into a hostage situation. And the worst part was Mm. I had to move on. I couldn't listen to it again. I had to keep going because I was limited on time because I had to go, go, go. You were begging to hear it again. You were like, please, 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 please. please, please." I need just one more taste, please. Um, This song, literally, I think like literally from the first listen, I knew what it was about. I saw the entire vision. I didn't have to decode uh-huh. it. That's probably like one of my favorite things about the song. It, it, I love a lot of the songs on like the main edition that are like, oh, this is really verbose and wordy and you have to like pick it apart. I didn't even suss out half the songs were about Maddie on the first listen because they're so fucking long and there's a lot going on. This one is so fucking direct to me. It was speaking to me in tongues. It was like I had the Rosetta Stone and it wasn't in pieces. It was all formed and I could read all the languages. And like, this is the song that literally made me understand so many things all at once. I understood mm. the Maddie and Taylor relationship like instantly. I was like, okay, now I get it. Mm-hmm. Now I understand literally everything. I understand how many years it's been. I understand why you were so fixated on this. And then I started to think about like the relationships that she had in the interim and how, for the record, when she says, um, you know, you just watched it and I all, I did all these things to just to desert you and outrun the fact that I deserted you. I think she's just like being dramatic. She wasn't literally the entire she's time. Just like, yeah, she's yeah, being yeah. hyperbolic. Um, but it is interesting to think about how when she's in these other relationships with these other men who all of them, literally Joe, Calvin and Tom Hiddleston, I'll give him a bone, kind of seem like they would beat the shit out of Maddie Healy on the schoolyard. They literally do. So yeah. let's start there. It could be either or. Right. And um, just thinking about her in these relationships and how none of them really worked out. And as they weren't working out and maybe she would have nights, what we know she would have nights because we heard it on the main record where she would think about him. And that's literally what the entire song is about. And it clicked to me. It was like, that's so Raven. I was like, oh my God, I get it. <laughs> Instantly. Instantly. And the fact that I, I like keep seeing this like at re- the bottom, the bottom of people's, like literally this is the worst song on the record to some people. To who? It can't. It can't. It be. can't it be. Can't be if you get into these fucking lyrics, and you're gonna tell me, I don't. That I, I can uh, accept a lot. I can't accept that. I can't accept that. Like I can't. It just makes no fucking sense to me. Like you're really gonna look at me and tell me that this isn't one of the best songs on the record? That doesn't make any fucking sense. I understand you. I also remember in your reaction the second that you heard the word hologram, you were like, "Oh no, oh no." It's over. It's finished. I get it now. Um, But I think, yeah, this really gagged me also in my notes. I wrote that it spells out the whole heartbreak and the core issue of the Maddie Healy saga. Sometimes, oftentimes, the question is better than the answer. And this sadly just added gasoline to the question is about Maddie Fire. And I hate it here. I want to die. But what's so devastating here is that Taylor is grieving a past version of herself that she like has no access to anymore and it really seems like when they put the brakes on whatever was going on in 2014 and we know it didn't actually actualize very much she feels as they come back to each other and circle back later that they were stuck as who they were and when they did eventually come back together he kind of seemed the same but all of her had you know changed like midnight rain and she could feel herself no longer being the person he was once interested in and her longing for him still burned so bright but it's like he didn't recognize her anymore damn this shit is sad well uh, to go right off of what you were just saying when she opens the second verse and she says you turned me into an idea of sorts she became unreality he became unreality to her and she she became unreality to her and she became unreality to him like they literally were just ideas in each other's heads this whole time and then they came together i mean i think taylor was like this is the best thing that's ever happened like she literally was sitting there like it's happening she was like we're doing it this is forever. Uh-huh. And he was in his head being like, now where's that girl with the bob? <laughs> where's my where's my little bitch with the bob? Where did yeah, she go? Where's that girl who was wearing I don't, two I pieces mean, and the exactly. harnesses backwards? Where'd she go? Exactly. And I mean, I don't I don't think that that's like something he did that's so evil or like he's so no. bad because he wanted I think that I don't we can't even get in his head. Not yet. Mm-mm. She can't. Not yet. She can't. That's also really important is that because he ghosted her, it seems like she has no closure on it, which is why there's right. like that's what's kind of a very bonkers. active 
pain in so many different parts of this record. But it's this sad idea of like ships passing in the night. There, This is definitely like a perspective that comes as you get older. When you're in your early 20s, when they met each other and like first started like flirting, you kind of feel like anything can happen and like you can circle back to stuff later. Like, okay, I'm just going to put a pause on that and I'll like in your head, you're like, right. eventually this will happen for me. But you realize life is a series of closed doors as you get older. You know, it's not so simple to just pick up where you left off. Life happens. As the decade would play us for fools and you saw my bones out with somebody new. I mean, it the, the idea of both of them kind of being on the sidelines and not fully paying attention to what the other is doing, but every so often looking over their shoulder and wondering, huh, what if? It's just a question. If you want to break my heart, say that I loved you the way that you were. What sends me into the to the next dimension is the final chorus when she just says, just say you love me. That's it. That's literally all I want. And then she says, I'm tearing up. <laughs> this song gets me fucking going. <laughs> and then at the end, when she says, um, say you'll always wonder because I wonder. Like, I don't want to be alone feeling like this. Just tell me that you have wondered too. And the T is that he had. Mm -hmm. And then he stopped. <laughs> and then he stopped. That's, that's what's so yeah. broken about it. I yeah. also think, you know, something else I picked up on is that there's such a definitive link to the crack that split her down the middle in 2016, the old Taylor, because that's who Maddie knows. He knows this prior model of her that was really irrevocably changed. Like the old Taylor is dead. She can't come to the phone right now. Um, she talks about a lot throughout this record how she's hardened and how she used to be more gentle, more soft. Um, and I think some part of Taylor really, you know, still wishes that never happened. And she's mm. very hung up on it too. Too impaired by my youth to know what to do. I changed into goddesses, villains, and fools, changed plans and lovers and outfits and rules, all to outrun my desertion of you. And you just watched it because you couldn't be bothered to stand up and ask me the fucking question. I had to ask you the question. At first, Literally. I was like, so so gagged. I was like, damn, so you went through all these versions of yourself as a distraction against your love for this random man who put the moves on you for two weeks and then peaced out. But like you said, I think a lot of this is overinflated deliberately, like for hyperbolic effect, reflecting that feeling of like the sudden intensity of just a very brief period in time. And clearly it wasn't that serious if she was able to pick up and enter a new, seemingly more serious and at least longer re lasting relationship than this one. But people are missing that like not seriousness when they're interpreting this album, don't you think? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In, like, many, many ways. Down Bad is, like, I take it extremely seriously. <laughs> Let's start there. But, like, they were not in that studio, you know, dead stone-faced serious. They were, like, mm -mm, alien no. abduction, ha, 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 <laughs> down <laughs> bad, crying at the gym. It's, like, it is serious, but it isn't. And I think some people really struggle with that kind of thing. And Taylor does that a lot. She's, I'm dead serious, mm -hmm. but also, hee hee. <laughs> hee hee. The line is fine. <laughs> and that's what's so yeah. compelling about her as an artist is you never really yeah. know. Like, who's afraid of little old me is actually not a joke. Like, it's not satire at all. It's, like, almost 100% right. serious. And <laughs> I think this is the first time that people have, like, picked up on that kind of intensity. And they're that's why they're pointing that song out as something they don't like. Critics, I mean. But... Either way, this is a great song. This is a very good song. Bellissimo Fantastica. I'm telling you, this this is the song. If it hasn't clicked for you, you need to go back. <laughs> I'm so serious. To it again. This needs to be explained. It does. It's so sad. I find it hard to listen to. Like, it's really oh, sad. Oh, I'm listening, baby. It's my most streamed. I, I, I mean, I, I, like, by double. <laughs> Dude, that's the sick really? part. Really? Yeah, by double. I think mine is Fortnite, Fortnite randomly. Oh. I just play it. I, it's like, just, it's like it's, it just comes on. It's my it most played on. from Midnight's. It just <laughs> I comes on and I never skip it. I just let her go. Right. How did it end? I think I have a hot take on this. What do you think about this song? Ooh, you have a hot take on how did it end? I I, so. I, I, what's your see now? I'm curious because I feel like I have a hot take on it too, and I haven't seen so many people saying this. I don't know if I do or not. So I when I did my kind of like combined the two albums and made one, I put how did it end right after so long London. Because I think mm -hmm. it's about Joe. Like, it's 100% about Joe. Is that a hot take? I haven't seen mm -hmm. anybody else say this. My, I, I could agree with you. My thing is that, actually, it, it does seem a lot like she keeps using British words. And it's about, like, being in a neighborhood. You know, the Heath, where they've right. been known to frequent. Um, my hot take on it is that I think this is a good example of an overwritten song. We really oh, period. We really need to pair back the lyrics okay. on this. Um, I, I think I know what you mean. Like, especially in the bridge. <laughs> 
and she's i love the part where she says my beloved ghost and me sitting in a tree d-y-i-n-g the thing that comes before is say it once again with feeling how the death rattle breathing <laughs> silence says the Come soul on, is leaving that's kind, i know what you mean it, it, the, that's a little bit the, much. The, 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 it's, but i do it's too much i love the, the my beloved ghost and me line well uh, i'm happy for you but I'm, I think I'm happy for me too. That in my opinion, this is what people are referring to when they say that sometimes she comes across like she's a first year creative writing student. It's like ostentatious overwriting to express a pretty simple idea and a foundational lesson in a creative writing class, a one on one, if you will. Show, don't tell. Express the idea in as few impactful words as possible rather than running in circles, trying to show off your vocabulary. The intention to me here is she's trying to come across as like smart, but I think that the effect is a little bewildering. You're kind of bashing your listener over the head with meaning. And I think that like, I don't know, it kind of insults their intelligence a little bit. You want to trust them to pick up on what you're putting down. And I think that Taylor's best written works are lyrically very sparse. Her most iconic lines are so resonant because they're like very beautifully straightforward and they speak to a real emotional truth. All that I know is I don't know how to be something you'd miss. There's nothing fancy or complicated about that, and it's a whole universe in one sentence. But here we've got like 10 different illusions and metaphors, then like a random tangential detour in second person. It's really all over the place. And then the bridge to me, I just feel like is a bit nonsensical. But the conceit of doing a relationship postmortem is super interesting, but I think that we lose the plot because she's likening her muse to a hothouse flower. There's victims to interlopers' glances. There are maladies. And then his absence is an empathetic hunger. And I've really tried to understand what that means. And it just, it feels like... Oh, that's interesting. Here, So that's, that's really interesting that you say that because the way that I read that is, come one, come all, it's happening again. The empathetic hunger descends. Everybody wants to know what happened. Come oh, one, come okay. all, it's yeah, happening I again. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know what you mean, though. That's like probably one of my favorite lines in the song. So I, um, mm. I've thought I about how that it a sounded. lot. I just didn't know what it meant. We'll tell no one except all of our friends. We must know how did it end. God damn. You need to get a bald cap and a pair of glasses. <laughs> 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 That's what I, I, I mean, I, I know what you're saying and I get it, but I'm turning it up. I just think... When we're talking about overwriting, this is a, a good example to me of something that I think is a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, especially that part in the bridge. That's the part where she loses me. Stop the you're death losing rattle, me. Girl. We could have just Stop. done the part about the ghost. <laughs> we could have, yep. like, I get it, like, oh, postmortem, death, death rattle. Like, I get mm -hmm. where we're going, but, but we don't I need think to it be making been... such bashing well, this is the time. over the head. What is death, Aaron death, doing? Death. <laughs> what is Aaron doing in the studio as she's going with the death rattle breathing? He's just going, <laughs> I'm <Yeah>. loving it. <laughs> Him and Jack offer absolutely no pushback when, with Taylor when she's writing. And you know how I know this? I was thinking about like, okay, why, what makes a good co-writer or an editor? They have to be good writers in and of themselves. Jack Antonoff's lyricism for Bleachers sucks. Like, it is famously bad. It's really cliche. It gets torn apart in every review. Like, he's not capable of doing good writing. And that's okay because God doesn't give with both hands. He's extremely prolific in other ways, but he's not a writer. And Aaron Dessner also with The National, like, their kind of songwriting, I think, is not super well aligned with what Taylor does. So I think that their perspectives are, they hear Taylor being so wordy and it's so different to them. They're like, yes, well, yes. Well, that's, I could never thought of that before. And then there's no one there to be like, like, where's Liz Rose being like, oh my God, this 10 minute song is incredible, but why don't we try and get it down to the five most incredible minutes? Period. Where yeah. is she? Bring her back. Where is she? She needs to come back. <laughs> she needs to come back. I think producer uh, uh, co-writer is a bit too blurred. Like I think she needs to have another like writer that's just there to hear the words. But I I understand that she probably at this point is like I don't want that. And it's a, it's like also it's like I would really love to see like how different songs come together. And it's like mm -hmm. on the manuscript, why are you the only writer? Is because you literally wrote every single word and and Aaron didn't say a word. He just said okay probably. piano. And so then it's like when they're in the studio together, if she's writing the song in the studio and he's there, is that a writing credit? We don't know. <laughs> I literally don't know. Question. It's it's so well, we know, fuzzy we to do me know now. We that st people steal writing credits a lot. And also artists like Taylor are sometimes generous in giving 
people writing credits maybe when they don't deserve it. We've been new. Mr. Bowery has been given some credits that I know he didn't deserve. But like a lot of like content is- issues that songwriters have with performers is that they'll come in and like change one or two words and get a songwriting credit. So it can be something as minor as that. It's just which interesting makes sense. to me to think about. I always think of them, them, honestly, the whenever I see them on, on writing credits, I'm like, they had one idea. That's honestly the way. I don't know if I'm biased because I'm a Swifty. <laughs> but like that's literally how I think about it. Well, I think about that clip of her doing Getaway Car with Jack, and it really is like it's mostly Taylor, and he's bouncing off of her, which is how it should be. Like he's right. like encouraging her and gassing her up, but they're not sitting there being like, "Okay, we have these lyrics, we have this production. What's going to work best?" They kind of it seems to me they get into a creative flow. And Taylor has always said as well that she can only work on one song at a time, which is interesting because a lot of other singers will like do a couple verses here, of course, there, and move on to something else. Taylor says she has to start and complete something before she can move on to anything else. Which right. to me, if you're creating at a very rapid pace, that means that you're not really revisiting the songs and like trying to make them better as you go along. Like maybe you edit right. in hindsight, right. but the process is very like. Okay, today we're doing this song and then it's done. And I also think that like for the anthology specifically, for the anthology specifically, like you can definitely hear, I mean, going from how did it end into where we're going next is like now these were written <laughs> in different centuries. That's literally how I think about them. So I think I mean, sometimes that's good. I think that there's a case to be made for chaos and then there's a case to be made for very clear, like I think it could go either way depending on the record. And I, I like what goes on in Torture Poets in terms of the different kinds of songs, you know what I mean? But on, on Anthology, when we're dropping so high school, like in the middle of like the witchcraft and the and the and the, and the like fairy tales and the what? folklore, it's ve- it's like she literally had to. It's my the way I'm thinking of it is like Travis was like, "What's the song about me?" Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, GTA. Uh, <laughs> that song. To me is, I guess we can just talk about that now. Yeah, also, just, right just a side it. note, I would love to hear more from Taylor about her creative process. Like, we've oh, been yes. needing that. Yeah. We've been needing, how did this happen? Like, I just feel like it's a piece of the puzzle that we've really been missing for so many albums now that I'm getting upset. Well, I like, need a we documentary. Need we need stories. We I want need stories. I just want to hear about how the idea came to you. Like, I would, I would. Uh, d- d- yeah, I would literally live to be able to see more, even just like two minute videos of her and Aaron in the studio together. What and who brought reputation. the song to who? How did the song start? Like, how did you get the idea? Et cetera, et cetera. Love and or diary of a song. Like? Right, give exactly. What, what happened to that? What happened to that? I miss it. Maybe she doesn't want to give away we, her we trade it. secrets, but no one can copy that. No <laughs> exactly. Can copy that. Nobody can copy that. So high school, touch me while your bros play Grand Theft Auto is a really really interesting line iconic here's my thing about so high school i i it's like my sleep paralysis demon and yet i find myself (laughs) reaching for it again it's like my ouija board don't touch the ouija board because you'll get (laughs) demons in the house and then it's like but i have to the demons are here and they're telling you (laughs) to play again i just love that part of the song it it, it is such an earworm and it gets stuck in my head oh yeah it's in my head all the time i'm thinking about it constantly constantly wow i'm not I have like over- about this song and no interest in it Here, here's my thing <laughs> here's my thing i think it, i think it should have been somewhere else being on the anthology is like a big issue and I, I i like the fact that she really like made it sound like a late 90s early 2000s like soft I like alternative the production rock song the production's mm-hmm. great um it's just so silly <laughs> it's just one of the silliest songs I've ever you're heard. You're a goose. And this is it's not a goose album. Honk, 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 honk. It's, it's not uh, that. It can't. I like it. I don't love it. That's the way I, I would refer to this song. I like it. I don't love it. It, it. it ruins the vibe. That's it. I think it's purposeless. When we're talking about bloat, when we're talking about too much, this would be an easy cull easy that this would be like a first pass okay that was just a warm-up for you a know song. I'm ball, write about travis later i know aristotle come on <laughs> you have to admit there's something there i like that i do you know how to ball i know aristotle period it reminds me of paris <laughs> which i came oh. around on eventually as camp 
but well, at first I was like, hello? no. <laughs> I was. I said no to Paris at first too. I hated Paris for like months, you, and then one yeah, day I turned it on, and I was like, "Hold on, there's a little something in this. <laughs> it's a little, then a you little were doing slice. slam poetry. You oh. were on the mic going, your oh, ex, your ex friend's sister. sister met someone in a club, and he kissed her, <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes. You said yes. <laughs> Slay. Up next is a very evermore kind of song. Yet again, this to me is giving Ivy. That's what was like my first kind of thought that I had. The guitar, it's I hate it here. And the guitar is so gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like she's just kind of singing into her phone. Like it has this direct tone to it. And it has such a pretty chorus. But the subject matter of the song is so special to me. It's about finding solace and hope and inspiration mm -hmm. in your rich inner world, a place where no one can no one else can access or interrupt your joy. And I think this is like especially poignant for Taylor as pretty much everything in her life is now up for public consumption, including the thoughts that come from this special place in the form of her songs. But ultimately, there's something she has that no one else has or can take away from her, her beautiful, sprawling, inventive imagination. Mm. And I really relate to this as like an only child and a writer, because sometimes the worlds that you make up are more fruitful than the one that you live in. And even the way that she describes it sounds like a dispatch straight from this place. I hate it here. So I go to lunar valleys in my mind on a planet where only the gentle survived. It's gorgeous. Let me ask you something. Have you ever heard of a mm -hmm. little song called Saturn? By SZA? That's the very first oh, thing yeah. I thought of when I heard the song. Uh, I it's didn't like literally even think about that. Oh my gosh. Love. And I love Saturn so much. It's like one of my favorite SZA songs uh -huh. ever. And um, as soon as I made that connection between I Hate It Here and Saturn, I was like, and I'm seated. <laughs> you have captured my attention, my friend. Um, what I, I, what I really love. I listened to the anthology before it came out and I was like, Madeline's going to like this one. Yeah, he did tell me that. Um, what he didn't know is that I was getting hit by a wrecking ball. <laughs> <laughs> only <laughs> only a few that. songs earlier this one it did click when i first heard it like i really liked it but i was so obsessed with chloe or sam i the first few days i didn't really listen to it the past few days i've been listening to it and listening to it um what i really love about this song is that it's kind of like one of taylor's most relatable songs ever and it has this kind of quality to it where it, it really is like oh you too huh <laughs> because me the mm -hmm. fuck too and i really relate to it it's one of the few songs about I think that there's a really like childhood aspect to it and I generally don't really care like I mean coming up with Robin Peter I really don't I don't care for songs about childhood I don't like never grow up it's not Flops. something that I return to and, and smile I'm not doing the best day but I am doing this <laughs> I am certainly doing this I am certainly reading books and disappearing and going off well this so I, I love this, this disposition really continues into the rest of her life which I think is what's nice about it because it's not about like a snapshot of youth. It's also about like her current reality. I'm lonely, but I'm good. I'm bitter, but I'm fine. I save all of my romanticism for my inner life. I love that line. I love it so much. And you know what's really misunderstood and what I think is a bad faith interpretation here? People are really getting hung up on that 1930s without all the yeah. racists part. Yeah. And it's like you're completely missing the point of the song. Yeah. You're being, again, literalism is a disease that is afflicting Swifty community. Yeah. But it's the you're missing the point of the song, which is that it's really hard to communicate your inner life to others. And it often comes across as alienating or weird to other people. You can't articulate the magic of that lunar valley in your mind because it is only for you and only you can understand it. And so when you try to say it, it comes out awkwardly. And that's to me what she's like expressing here. Right. She's not literally saying she would like to live in the 1830s. Well, what really bothers me about it is like the, the whole verse is about how that game isn't fun unless mm -hmm. you are a white man that game is not fun mm -hmm. unless you are a white man and her dumb friends weren't thinking about it and then she said oh if only it wasn't riddled with racists and it wasn't you're the most sexist type etc cetera, etc cetera. and what she's saying is like it was never good nostalgia is a mind trick yeah. if i was there i would have hated it too i would have hated every single day it, it doesn't matter i hate it here period of that's time. literally what mm -hmm. she's saying exactly and it's just like i don't understand why that's so hard to understand <laughs> I literally don't get it. Literally. And people there are is like, a decline in literacy. Right. It's really scary. Like, there is something here about her being tired of her present circumstances whenever they were. Was it ever fun? She's asking herself. Also, like, not just about that period of time, but also, like, playing these games, being with these people, um, being sociable, being a person that exists in the world. Is that fun for me? Maybe not, but it doesn't matter because she has this private steady solace that's available to her whenever she wants. But also that solace is kind of a prison for her because if it's the only place where you can, if the only place where you can really truly feel free is a space where you are totally alone, 
that's a pretty isolating place to be. And she says here that she was supposed to be a debutante in another life, which is like a celebrated, admired girl who has a moment in the sun, but then goes on to live a normal life, preening and still being perfect, but under less scrutiny. But in contrast, Taylor, you know, is a debutante of source, but the debut never ends. She's still under that spotlight. And now right. she's scared to go outside. The people aren't getting it. They're not getting it. This is another mm -hmm. one I see being ranked dead last. Get a clue. They don't get it. Okay. You have to be a person who reads real books, not Fifty <laughs> Shades of Grey, Fifty not Shades of Grey, Seven but... Husbands of Ale Evelyn Hugo, or whatever the f hell. Not that. Real books. Real <laughs> you books. have to read them to understand. But yeah, a quiet highlight, and also this and uh, the prophecy, and also I look in people's windows are so evermore to me, and the albatross yeah. too. Incredibly evermore. And I'm gagging and they I'm looking for it. it all. They reek of it all. <laughs> I see that plaid jacket. Stop trying to hide it. <laughs> <laughs> I Okay, now we're really kind of losing the plot because we're up to thank you, Amy. Girl, do we need I this? It. Who asked? I cricket. I cricket in every possible way that there is to cricket. Here's my thing about it. I don't want anybody to misconstrue me. I'm, I mm -hmm. would never say, oh, get over it. You have to stop talking about mm -hmm. it now. What My problem with it is that like when we already have so many songs about this exact thing, if you're going to do another one, it better be good. Come up with something else. <laughs> it fucking is it. Say it's, something else. I can't with same. it. It's the same it's the same thing over and over again. And I agree. I think it's so annoying when Swifties like descend and go, how dare you tell her to get over it? And it's like, no one is telling her to get over it. But at this point, you know, there is something weird about her continuing to frame this as an act of conflict when Kim has truly been cricket about it, like for years, unless she's responding to something that Taylor says. Right. Like clearly Taylor's not done taking her shots about this situation. And that's like, she's within her rights to do that, of course. But I think most of us are ready for that to be over with. And I'm not saying that she needs to get over it. But like when you're writing songs like this, if the purpose is just to like get something out and like feel a bit of catharsis, that's great. But putting it out into the world, what's the purpose of this song on the record? It doesn't cover any emotional terrain that she hasn't covered on this song, sorry, on this subject or on this album elsewhere in right. other subjects. And it doesn't uh, add to our understanding of what happened and nor does it tie into the theme of the record. So I'm kind of like, it comes across as like, na 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 na, I win, you lose. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, that's obvious. <laughs> that is very obvious. I don't, there's just something about it. It's like also framing her as like a high school bully. I get it. But it was so good of a metaphor that I actually had no idea this was supposed to be about Kim Kardashian until like three days ago. I thought it was about just a school I, bully, and I preferred it that way. I think it's way. a composite That's the funny sketch. Thing. I think it can be about. I think it can be about more than that. But it. I mean the and also the the capitalizing of Kim in the title of the song. It's like again, why are you bashing the listener over the head with your secret messages? Like, if you dig into the song enough, you listen to it enough times, you'd come to the conclusion anyway. But again, it's very much kind of like dancing on someone's grave. <laughs> like, come on, this is done. Like, why do we need to keep doing this over and over again? It's like, you say you're tired of the drama and you don't want to do it anymore, but who's bringing it up? It needs to be said. This song, and, and again, it's like, the, the real issue is that it's just... Eh, Not that good. I can't, I, I can't, I can't it, with it. If it boots... If it said something different, I would right. be like, yes, end her, get her again for me. But it just is not that interesting. The one line I do like is there wouldn't be this if there hadn't been you. Exactly. That's yeah, a thread that's a really good that she one. hasn't explored so much, but she drops it as soon as it comes up. How pain can push you forward and like make you smarter. Got smarter, got harder in the nick of time. Actually, she did say that on Look What You Made Me Do. So she did actually explore that. <laughs> she literally said that. But <laughs> the bridge is so weird. She says, I changed your name in real defining clues. I mean, you capitalized You Kim. put Kim in the title. And you brought up her daughter. And you called her a bronze they don't, statue. They don't like that. <laughs> they don't like that. The people are already descending on her about that. I guess, like, I don't well, think she says anything horrible about the, like, no. I mean, obviously not. But No, no, no. But she's doing this, mm, nah, nah. <laughs> like she literally is going, ha, 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 I win, you lose. She's literally, sorry, Kyle, you lose. Camille. You know, <laughs> goodbye, <laughs> Kyle. <laughs> you know, something that I keep seeing people say about Taylor is that she's like deeply immature. I don't agree with that most of the time. Mm -hmm. There are some, I mean, you're going to look at me and say, Chloe et al. is immature, my fat ass. There's a lot of really good maturity shown on this record. 
it's a, it's doesn't want this one. No, here, <laughs> not it, not here. And it's like it's well, her yeah, right. A lot of people will say it's her right mm, it's her to right. be a little baby sometimes. But I, it's mm-hmm. also my right to say no thanks. I don't want to hear it anymore. <laughs> I don't want to hear that. That's my yeah. right to say. And a lot of yeah. people will also say like, oh, but daddy, I love him as immature. And it's like to that, I'm easily like, you don't get it. That's not serious. Also, it's dead serious. Well, first of all, also, that's on boost. Boots. Yeah, and it boots. It works. <laughs> this song is just there. It just exists. I do like the line about like my mother is a saintly woman. Oh, um, I love that. And she Period. wants you to die. I thought that was good. Uh, w- yeah, that part was good. I mean, what? let's not bring Andrea Swift into it again. <laughs> Can we let anyone live? Can we no. go on? Can we move <laughs> on? I'm trying to think. There has been a reference to this on every single album since Reputation. Every single album. That's what, five albums? Girl. I'm silent. And <laughs> I'm how many silent. of those are, are how and how many of those songs are great songs? So there are some. There are some. Oh, there's some good ones. There's some but, really good ones. But at this point, it's not. I think we have we have drawn all the blood from the stone. Like it's done. We know everything we yeah. need to know. And she's not even done with it on this record. This isn't even the last mention of it, which is what's crazy to me. But yeah, I guess let's move on to something more positive. <laughs> I look in people's windows. <laughs> Period. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I love this even song. New. I absolutely love this song. Me the production too. is insane. Did you oh, know that the so Patrick special. Berger is a Charlie XCX collaborator? That's where I I've heard that name before. That. And Hillary well, bring him back. Hillary Duff. Hillary. <laughs> now, now we're cooking what's with the, peanut that, oil. What's the song it was? It was the, the little Beyonce voice of Disney in Channel. my head won't let head me forget. Won't let me forget. From Metamorphosis. That's We're really aging ourselves. Period. All my viewers are going to be like, what's XCX, that? Who's that? Charlie XCX, Hillary Duff, and I look in people's windows. He's everywhere. He's everything. That's the holy trinity. <laughs> That's Charlie the holy XCX, trinity. Hillary Duff, and I look in people's windows. They all exactly. share one thing, and it's excellence. Mm-hmm. Exactly. The instrumentation the is so pretty. It's Gorgina. Um, th- definitely Evermore. So Evermore mm. vibes. But I like how it's not a straightforward acoustic song because of that production. There are some like quirky elements yeah. that are really interesting. And I also love that it's short. I think the length really works. For me, Mama wanted another minute. <laughs> I definitely <laughs> want another minute. I love the song. I love the concept of it too. I just like the idea of like using social media as like a window to see into people's lives. And like I'm scrolling mindlessly, but really I'm looking for you mm-hmm. is like ingenious to me. I mean, she needs to be a Shakespeare. Shakespeare. To go from thank you, she Amy, <laughs> into I look in people's windows is like, <laughs> now that's the duality of man. <laughs> that is the duality that, of man. <laughs> that's, a, that's a torture poet. That yeah, is a, torture a tortured poet. I think, yeah, a line that I love here is, I'm afflicted by the not knowing. Mm. And this is one of my favorite threads that has come out through her career as she's like aged, which is the what ifs, the, the yeah. could haves, the would haves, the should haves. I'm addicted to the if only. Love, mm. love. I think this is also about, I think what I mentioned in, what song did I talk about this during? When you, oh, I think it was, I'm going to get you back actually. no. Chloe or Sam or Marcus, um, imagining the different versions of your life, what shapes they could take, who you might have become if you followed the road with right. a different person, and also definitely social media stalking because I feel like we don't ever think – like when I look at Taylor Swift's Instagram account, I'm like, that's not a person. This this is a billboard. But then she's right. on it, searching yep. for people and looking and zooming and like thinking. I'm sure she's a Finsta, but it just is crazy for me to think about that, that she's just stalking. Are you looking in our window? Hello. Hello. <laughs> it's like that horse outside the tent, you know, that tickle. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just looking in. It's like, oh, oh. Gizmo. <laughs> Gizmo. <laughs> um, up next, a lyrical highlight, I think. The prophecy. What do you think about the prophecy, Madeline? Here's my thing about the prophecy. Gorgina, World of Warcraft. Heard of it? Do, 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 do. It takes me to a faraway it. land. Because I'm cool. Far away. <laughs> oh, right. You've never heard of World of Warcraft. <laughs> I have. Right. I've never seen it or played it or been around anyone. But you, plays you've it. heard of it and you you know what it is. I know what <laughs> it is. I know what it is. <laughs> Anyway, it takes you to a faraway land, and that's what I love about it. I, I love all of the. It's a very clear. There's some songs where she kind of like metaphor drop, metaphor jumps. This is one where it's mm-hmm. like I know exactly all the way what through. I'm talking about. Yeah, she and I, so I love that about it. Exactly. Um, I do find that 
I, I've really had a hard time like really getting into it. I know this is like a yes. people love this song and I'm like, I, I do. I really mm. like it. I really like the idea, but I find myself like not being able to sit down and listen to it sit because I'm it. thinking about something yeah. else. Yeah. Well, it's here's Gina, the thing. Though. I think it suffers because of the production. I think really it's the production that is a bit boring. It's a bit one note. Melodically, it's kind of the same. So I think that's why it's not that interesting to listen to. And I, I am torn about this song because I think sonically it's not cogent with the rest of torture poets but i think thematically it has a lot to do with what's on the standard edition really interesting train of thought a lot of people know taylor swift existentially as the broken-hearted girl sure she's in and out of relationships but she's most celebrated right. when she's most devastated and it seems like whenever she's truly aching is when her art gets vaulted the most and she gets that success that she craves and i immediately thought of this image we have of her I, the, in the public i think thinks of taylor as the right where you left me girl like still 23 insider fantasy unable to move on after a particularly devastated heartbreak furiously scribbling in her journal so i have always wondered how she wrestles with like that that image of her that the public has and hasn't really changed and here she's like turning a superstitious lens to it which is actually mm. kind of the theme that goes through like a lot of her works and i think it's an anxiety thing as well like a uh, you know when uh, ruminating like overthinking things like that um thought I caught lightning in a bottle oh but it's gone again this image of her like in the chorus I, I see her just like cliffside stormy night lightning bolts in the sky on her knees mm. begging please please change the prophecy don't want money just want someone who wants my company let it once be me who do I have to speak to about if they can redo the prophecy? Taylor has so much agency in her life and so much control over how every little thing plays out, so much force to exert over people and everything else. And love has always been that one area where she has very little control. And it's compelling here how she's saying she doesn't want money. She's like, I'll give it all up, this career that I've built on my broken heart, just to never have to experience a broken heart again. I howl at the moon. <laughs> she howls like a wolf. with a coven <laughs> round a sorceress's <laughs> table. Hello. It's really in different areas lyrically. It's in different areas. It really is lyrically. I mean, she's she's doing the thing that everybody said, "Stop doing it. Stop being a witch." And she said, <laughs> "And yeah. I'm going to do it even harder. <laughs> I'm going to do it she even harder." <laughs> she loves to push that button so much that I'm starting to wonder if maybe she is a witch. And if she is, boots that would explain a lot. Well, we need the love potion. That would we explain the love a lot. Well, you she was have said, a witch, I mean, she would have had that. Well, already. she uh, perhaps she's been giving it to Travis, and that would explain a but lot. It would. It would it explain would. a lot. Oh wow! Something well, that like absolutely yeah. gags me about the song is when she said, "No sign of soulmates. I'm just a paperweight." It makes me want to put a bullet in my head. Oh my god! I'm just a that paperweight, really... Zach. Uh uh. Boo, hiss, tomato. Boo, tomato. Hiss. <laughs> tomato. When I find you. Another thing that I really want, <laughs> if like talking about like how the songs are made, Mama would love a timeline. <laughs> I would absolutely oh. love to know when this fucking song was written. Need to know. For God's sake. Need well, to know. Well, we're gonna if you're if you're an evolution of a snakehead, if you're new here, we are gonna be doing a timeline. That's coming. And you're gonna gag. We're gonna try and figure it out. We're gonna do our very best to piece it together. We did this for Jover. Uh, for the whole relationship all the way through that obviously was easier because there was way more ground to cover more songs right. to listen to this is i keep the maddie thing is interesting because like you said the timeline is really confusing the thing that i'm certain of is that their period of being together was very brief and there was no back and forth it was like i want to see you again we're seeing each other it's over to me i'm pretty clear that that is the timeline but mm -hmm. There are a couple songs that suggest otherwise. Well, I mean, when we start getting into I mean, I know everybody's kind of like playing dolls with like all the Folk Levermore songs. Me personally, there's very few that I would like really be like, oh, yeah, only and barely the one any. is the only one that I'm committed to maybe being about him. But I'm also committed to that still being about Harry Styles. I refuse to give that up. <laughs> well, we have to we have to allow ourselves our little dalliances, you know. I mean, uh, and it could be we about have our delusions. Anything. It could be about anything. And what's That's been the driving thing. me crazy is how aggressive people are getting about their interpretations of things. Well, they were like, saying they were being... being so rude in my comment section about they were getting a, my an ass. Opinion. Oh yeah, they were getting. I'm not even an opinion. I was just having a, a laugh. <laughs> I was having mm -hmm. a laugh about a chuckle. And what what am I supposed to not point it out? 
<laughs> you, am I supposed to not bring it up? But that's not allowed. We're not allowed to laugh. We're not allowed to smile. Everything no, has to be. There's no kiki allowed wrong. on the internet. You're wrong. Mm-hmm. It's like being like everything has to be about like be nice and, and, and about and, and cool until to it's everyone in the world until it's in my comments. <laughs> until it's in my fucking <laughs> until it comes to us until yeah. it's evolution of a snake hosts die yeah then it's goodbye and then it then it's um, something else i mean whatever you wish you could be us Oof, i don't period. even know how we got um, off on that fucking tangent <laughs> <laughs> anyway <laughs> let's the prophecy is good um but this yes. part this part of the record my first listen around is really when i started to struggle after the prophecy i was like oh mm. no yep. and up next we have cassandra i'm tired yeah i was fading i i i I, here's a here's the thing about it if i forget what she's actually talking about if i drift away and go into the fantasy world i'm like okay i like the song Mm -hmm. i like it just thinking about it being about cassandra like literally she wrote a song Mm -hmm. about cassandra i'm like okay i'm fucking with this she needs to be doing that more often we need a joan of arc taylor swift now (laughs) we need joan of arc by taylor swift now and this is like almost that but it's like when you when you think about what it's actually about i like it i i like the production I like the idea, but when I remember, then I say, <laughs> I've had enough. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah. Also, she kind of takes you out of it by she's talking about Cassandra and all these vipers, and then it's blood thick, blood's thick, but nothing like a payroll, girl. Enough. And what's sad is that I'm that's, that's like a this. really, it's like a really good line, but it doesn't work in the song because I thought mm-hmm. we were talking about medieval. I, that's the line Flat that plague, stuck out bubonic. to me too. Yeah. You're in your <laughs> what happened to the bubonic plague? And you're talking about payrolls? Well, this, these your are the serfs. in the corner. <laughs> I don't want this. You're on the... <laughs> what, what, what was it called? The landowner. He was like the knight or whatever. I, let's get the out of this. The baron or whatever. The baron or whatever. I mean, we've gone fuck. over this subject a hundred times from a hundred different angles. And it's frustrating because it feels like this song, and thank you, Amy, have no purpose. This one a little bit less have no purpose other than to settle scores and remind people that she was wrong. At this point, it's also a one-sided war because no one else is responding. There's no doubt that what happened to her was traumatic, but again, I just don't think we need to take up space in this era rehashing something we've heard well, about. It, 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 it's kind of embarrassing. I mean, I, I, I They're hesitate get me to for use that. the word embarrassing. They, but... s- they scream at us when we say this, but at a certain point, it's like, come on. Like, if the songs are excellent, sure, but these aren't excellent songs. Mm, I, I think this one could have been chopped off. I, I think it, it's mm-hmm. it's got the same kind of vibes as like the prophecy and the albatross. Like it's witchy and mysterious, but it's like it, I don't I don't think we needed it. That's just my truth. If I had to pick this or thank you, Amy, I would pick this. I would pick Cassandra. Oh, instead. me too. Me too. I, I will say that. Thank you, Amy. Is de- that's like I think maybe my least favorite song on like the whole shebang. I haven't decided yet, but well, it's, it's close. It's not mine. It's close to it, but it's not mine. Up next, Peter. At this point, I'm losing the will to live. I briefly come alive <laughs> at the possibility of this being about Harry, though. I sit up. I sit up. The but... thing that I've been seeing the most is people saying it's about Maddie. No, shut up. I see it in more, but it's like, well, put him in a pair of tights. It doesn't yeah. work. I've seen Harold what, in tights. That's lost, the thing. Lost, <laughs> lost voice chapter of your life. Harry Styles One Direction. More likely than you think. More likely um, than you think. I like the line, we both did what we could do underneath the same moon in different galaxies. Mm-hmm. Yep. I like that one too. I, like that. I also like when she says, um, she says, I'm putting up my notes. Uh, love's never lost when perspective is earned. It's very cute. Mm. And it's true. You know what though? Sonically, this is the exact kind of song that I hate. It gives Dorothea, it just gives the songs that even if they are good, I hate them. Like, there's just something about it that is ear blood to me. And I can never put my finger on what it is, but I know it when I hear it. And this is it. Well, I don't really like the chorus. You said you were going to come for me. And please, then you, please, you said you please. were, you said you were. And hey, she's like, Dorothy, do- leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> leave me alone. Spare me. Change the prophecy. Please change the prophecy. I can't do this anymore. <laughs> Well, um, my, my my main issue with the song is that I'm not a Peter Pan. I don't think about it. I don't like it. I don't – I would kill – if I was 11 forever, bullet in the brain. No, I'd do that first. Bad, boo, I can't do that. Hiss. Bad, boo, hiss. I'm not doing that. It's not romantic to me. I'm, I, I feel like cut. Taylor is one of those kinds of people who thinks it's, like, cute. Kids being in love. I don't care. <laughs> I don't no. care. You need to grow up. The you most I can to tolerate up. that is Betty. Betty is the max amount of that that I can tolerate. Because it's about well, teenagers, teenagers is a different are, thing. Are more 
complex than an 11 year old. Um, but thanks Taylor for that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, easy cut the bolter. Now this one is growing on me. It better be. <laughs> it better be. <laughs> it shut up. It made it. I did a, a ranking of both albums separately today and it was in my top five. I was like, Oh, okay. Oh. I'm a fan. Wow. I'm a fan. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a bolter head. I love the melody, Lucina. first of all. That's like my absolutely favorite. It's it's so the like the hook is addictive. Mm, 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 mm. It just kind of like mm -hmm. makes me it makes me feel alive. Especially after like the, the song run that we just had. We need the bolter. We've been needing this. <laughs> We've been fucking needing this. And the other thing that I really like about it is like I said at the top of the episode, 1954, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's the only thing I it's like it just takes me away. Greece. That's what it reminds me of. It gives I love it. Roman Holiday. It gives mm. Um, mm. someone I was reading a, an article about Taylor and they, randomly they brought up the bolter and they said it may be loosely based on the life of Edina Sackville, an Edwardian era socialite who earned the nickname in the song's title for her several marriages. Sure. Yep, yeah, sure. I the the way Edwardian that I era, she likes it there. Right, she loves it there. <laughs> I was kind of primed by the song because when the, when the title first came out, I was like, what the fuck is that? And um, I found this book that was about women around kind of like that time period who like refused to get married. And so they were called bolters because they just like would not settle down and be with somebody. They would just like fuck off. So I that's kind go. of like immediately how I went into thinking about the song. And there you go. I also love it there when it she is. says all her fucking lives flash before her eyes. Mm. And when mm -hmm. she says that, what it makes me think of, I've seen a couple of different interpretations of it, but this is mine. It, comparing it to like when she went under the ice and then came out alive is like when she's with somebody and she has this moment where she's like, I can see our whole life play out in front of me. And I'm like, absolutely not. And I fuck bolt. That's literally what it makes me think of. Yeah, I see that. I like it a lot. I think I just haven't spent a lot of time with it because yeah. I've really been focusing actually on the standard edition and really getting to know those songs. That mm -hmm. has been kind of my priority. Um, but I can't say it's going to come up a lot in my rotation. Like I don't hate it, but it's not like it's kind of a middling song to me. Robin, my notes on this are literally dot, dot, dot. I don't care to comment dot goodbye dot. It's not for us. I genuinely feel that way. I think that was for Aaron's family. I think that was for Aaron's family. It's it does nothing. And it for should me. have been sent as a Dropbox link. It shouldn't have been on the anthology. Way to go, Tiger! <laughs> Stop. What is the point of this? Seriously, this is what I mean. It's like you know what? Sometimes just keep it in the drafts. Just keep it to yourself. We didn't need that. It's just not going to get very much play by me. Again, and then, I don't like know, to every, ruminate. Every time you say that something is like not good as well, people will storm into your comments. There's a shooter for every song. So I'm sure that we're going to get an insane screed down below about why Robin is the best song ever created. I had someone try to tell me it was about Robin Williams the other day. <laughs> Did you see I reference uh, the cult of Mother God? That's what it makes me think of. <laughs> <Mother God. laughs> oh, oh, please. That oh. and don't. That was truly disturbing his grave. <laughs> that was a that, disturbance of was. his grave. It was. That was wrong. That was so wrong. Taylor is kind this of mother is not that. coded in a certain way. <laughs> she is. No, in a lot of ways, she is. In many ways, She's she my is. Mother God. <laughs> She's I'm my mother god. I'll tell you what. I am so happy being living in the trailer out in the desert and not being able to have <laughs> Drinking Peters. Drinking colloidal silver. <laughs> because Robin Williams from beyond the grave said that I didn't deserve <laughs> to have heat. <laughs> oh, I yeah, I love how all her spirit guys were like dead famous Hollywood actors. Donald Trump too. One. Donald Trump was one of oh. them. He's lived. He's the he was oh the one God, wow. live one. He was the one live one. Wow. I'm sure Robin Williams and Donald Trump would have a lot to say to each other. And that's how little <laughs> we have to say about Robin the song. Now we're talking about Cult of Mother we God. Have Mother God. I can't. There I you literally go. nothing. Thank you. <laughs> Last on the anthology, a very interesting song, a quiet devastation that I wish was not buried on the last track because I was so fatigued when I reached the end of it that I didn't really like sink into it. I think we could have cut three songs, gone straight to this, the manuscript. The yeah, manuscript. this one only just clicked for me like today. I me knew what it was about yesterday, but like I couldn't. 
I was just like, I, I, there's so much going on. I can't give the time to it. When I was like sitting today and I listened to it a few times and wrote the lyrics, I was ready to jump. <laughs> I was getting mm-hmm. really ready to jump. It's crazy. This is serious. The, yeah, it's the one joke, note that I would have about the song is like it's super referential. We could have been doing a little bit of sampling and a little bit of interpolating. Do you not think so? Ooh, that I think it's like a real if we had missed a opportunity. Tolerated piano coming in there that could have been interesting. Just, just a little, a little beautiful dear John moment. Yeah, just like I, I don't understand why we weren't doing that. <laughs> I mean, it just would have been absolutely Gorgina. You know, when Halsey it sampled Hurricane in Gasoline, that's like one of the craziest moments in song history. I go insane for it every Why time. Why don't we do that? Why don't in we do that? Taylor Swift songs. I mean, when she did it on question, we screamed. Right. I screamed personally. Did, well, I loved that. Is it though? That's the thing about it. Is it Be or is it a coincidence? Quiet. <laughs> is it all <laughs> simply a coincidence <laughs> enough no i can't do that right now um the manuscript i love the idea of her sitting there and re- reading this big old dusty book full of all the gorgeous tales she's written about her muse her broken heart throughout her life um the second verse devastated me and i think it's a good way to describe an age gap because age gap discourse online has become really annoying it's very much about like if you are in an age gap relationship you are dating a predator and i think that that is just not really not the way to be looking at these things but there is a power imbalance that like is interesting to discuss um afterwards she only ate kid cereal and couldn't sleep until unless it was in her mother's bed then she dated boys who were her own age with dartboards on the backs of their doors she thought about how he had set how he had said since she was so wise beyond her years everything had been above board she wasn't sure girl the thing that makes me want to like hunt him like a dog is when she says that they compared their licenses the only reason you would do that is to be like how old are you if you have to do that she's too young (laughs) if you have to do that she's too young yeah ew i mean yeah we i think we all immediately clocked that would have could have should have tea um john mayer is never ever getting a rest i will not stop until he receives justice i thought this was about all too well what i mean i guess so yeah but i think it also <laughs> like that. what i thought this was about jake jono and all too well mm, well i mean they're kind of linked again a composite sketch this is about dating an older man right Right. Um, I can see. Well, the reason about... that I, the reason that I thought that was because, like, I just feel like she has she that was younger feeling when about. She dated John, though. She was like eight. Well, here's l- listen, listen. John. Here's what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying. So when she's talking about the manuscript and the story isn't mine anymore, she's made allusions to the fact that all too well yeah, was a miserable song for her to play, away. and now mm-hmm. it's for, and now it's a completely different thing that has had the story completely changed. I think that the song in general is about how she puts her songs into the world and they become something else for other people. And this is just one oh, trauma no, that right. she's talking about. I'm looking at the lyrics. The actors were hitting their marks, literally filming the All Too Well short. Well, that's why I said this is the only song that Dylan yes. O'Brien gets. <laughs> this is a song. Dylan, you made it. <laughs> you made it. <laughs> I love but that. But I think it is it is a composite sketch though. This is about more than just that. That's just like the main thread that I got that she's like using him yes. to represent it's the best example of it yeah. happening in real life. But it's this idea of her releasing these painful stories and awful times to the fans right. and like how exactly. cathartic that must be and what a necessity writing is for her healing. Exactly. And and um in my, I got the manuscript deluxe edition CD, and it came with the photo cards, which are actually nice. But I got one. Mm. It just says, um, "The story isn't mine anymore." I love it. <laughs> I literally, oh. it's the only thing in my deluxe Taylor CD. Edition, I was like, "When I find yes. you for canceling my order, you're really going to be in trouble." Which one did you order? Which ones did you get? I had the Black Dog, and mm. I think the Albatross. Those two. Well, the best thing that came in those things was the patches. That's like the the main thing. That I, I, really I, which I, I would not they, use. Oh, so that's okay. Well, period. There you go. I mean, we need to do some Maddie healing. Really, is the <laughs> is the kind of how long have you had that sitting there in your notes? We need to do some Maddie healing. <laughs> that's actually not. In that's awe. not in my notes. I just read the word healing, and then I was and like, oh, like, I should say this. This is an important thing Maddie to say. healing. And it is. Mm-hmm. Interesting, Maddie healing. <laughs> That was a good one. I like that. <laughs> Do you think she's Maddie healed? I don't know about that. 
maybe i don't know it's really hard to tell because i i i think that you know things happen and like you can't push something away just because you're like oh i don't know if i'm ready blah, blah. or maybe you could i don't know but what i'm saying is like I do kind of think like this was so traumatic from the way that she's writing about it. And then it's like two seconds later, mm -hmm. she's dating Travis, which I it's it seems to be going fine. So it's like whatever. But it just kind of this seems like life. this is this just is how it life. always goes. So, um, I, I, please you know, change what? the prophecy I, is all I have to say about that. Yeah, please change the prophecy. Please change the pro we'll see um, what happens. So I think <laughs> overall, I think that a lot of people have pointed to the anthology as like just a completely unnecessary addendum to the record. And I really disagree with that because there's plenty to sink your teeth into here, but she has also included some things that do not have any business being here. That is true. I, I, I would agree with that. I think that it, she wanted to do a double album. I think that was really the main thing. And like, you can't do a double album and one of them is only 10 songs long. I think that's how she felt about it. So she was like, mm. well, I've got some middling, <laughs> I've got some middling songs I can throw on there. And this that's in the what back she did. Drawer collecting dust. Yeah. And you know, the thing I is, I wonder if I... any of these were Evermore outtakes. I do wonder that. Interesting. That would piss me off. I wonder which ones they would have Because they been. would have had no place on Midnight's, really. Like they would have, mm. like they're, they're, the Ari right. Dustner productions on that aren't even really very Evermore-ish, but... You know, I think maybe she said, let me give Evermore the re-up. And, and yeah. I clapped for that. Oh, I clapped. I was clapping. I was absolutely clapping. I, I wonder if she thought, like, people are going to think that this album is going to be like another folklore. And it sincerely was not going to be. So she was like, well, I'll give them a little bone. I got something for you. <laughs> I'll give them and a she little did. something to chew on. Do you and have I a chewed preference it. between part A and part B? No, I can't even decide if I think about them separately. That's the thing. It's like, I, I now I, when I listen to it, I listen to the playlist I made where they're combined. So I don't, I don't, at this point, I I'm barely, yeah, I'm barely thinking Double about them album, separate. Even to me is like, I view this the same way that I viewed the 3 a.m. edition of Midnight's, really. Like, it's just bonus songs. Right. I don't exactly. view it as a separate album at all. Um, and also they're not linked enough to be a double album either. So it's kind of this like awkward in between place. But I'm grateful for what we received. Oh, I'm, I'm eating. Wrong. I'm, I'm at the buffet. I, I like, I, I kind here. of like having both because i just feel like it, it makes it more round on the playlist than i have my perfect in a perfect world playlist thank you amy she's not there florida <laughs> gone we, we sawed florida off the united states that's not Bigger among than us the anymore whole sky <laughs> goodbye 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 man my there playlist are some is shooters 14 songs which is too short i need to add some more onto that but I was trying to see if I could get a front to back, like superstar only record. And I think my limit is going to be 16. That's crazy. Challenge myself. Mine's, mine's 22. <laughs> mine's 22 songs long. That's my short one. Poetology. That's your short one. How That's many is it total? One. 31? Yeah. Jesus I cut Christ. nine songs. That's, That's so a lot many of songs. songs. That's a lot of songs. That's I cut nine so songs. So many songs. Period. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's it for this episode of the evolution of a snake. Don't forget to go to our Patreon. I keep forgetting to put that at the beginning of the video. No, we need to be doing episodes. that. We need to shake the Go cup. to the Patreon, patreon.com slash Swiftologist for hearing from us every week and also getting all of our unedited reactions and access to our Discord server, which is full of the funniest, best Swifties that are not uh, afflicted by brain rot. So, cup shaking. Cup shaking. I'll shake my cup. And I would say Lisa. go buy tickets to Evolution of a Snake Live, but you can't because it's sold out. Sold out. You snoozed, you lose. Sorry, divas. <laughs> you snoozed and you lost. You snoozed and you lost. Thank you very much. Thank we, you. Thank you. We will see you next time to talk about some Maddie healing. Huh? Goodbye. <laughs>